All right, so today's lecture should be really simple. We just need to go over a very, uh, very basic concept about flywheel design. And first of all, uh, we need to talk about a, a DC motor. So um, up to this point, you have learned how to use uh, Newton's equations or use new, uh, energy method to calculate the uh, driving torque required for a four bar linkage. So usually when you have a four bar linkage, it has input link, you have a coupler, you have an output link, and then you have a ground link. And then the reason why we call these link as inputs is because we usually install a motor at that joint to drive the system, okay? So that's why it's called input link. And then how to choose that motor to make sure we can drive it. So that's the, um, that's the purpose of this lecture. So, so there were, usually there are two major uh, motors in the, uh, um, in the market. So if you work in industry, AC motor is more common. But then if you're in the lab, DC motor because of the uh, simplicity. So we usually use DC motor as well. Um, so in this class, we only talk about DC motor because it's simpler, okay? So first of all, how does a DC motor look like? So a DC motor usually has a a pair of permanent magnets. So there is a north side, that's the uh, south pole. And then between these two magnets, you're gonna see magnetic flux, okay? Let's name this flux value as five. And then this five is usually a constant when, you're, when you have a, a DC motor design already. So this phi is given, okay? And inside of these magnetic fields, we usually have some coils, okay? So that's a coil. And then at the end of this coil, we have a pair of brush. And then this brush is connected to a DC power source. That's a positive, that's negative. So that's the schematic of uh, a, a, um, a very typical um, DC motor. So as you can see here, because there is a DC power supply, and then that's generating a current going through, through these paths, and then going backward, and then it returns back to your source, okay? So let's look at these part. So when you have a current going through a man magnetic field, then we're talking about Lorentz force. So how much is the Lorentz force? Is F, when you have a straight line, a, a straight conductor in this magnetic field, this force equals to the value of your um, current, the strength of your magnetic flux, and also the length, the total length of your, uh, your wire, okay? So that's the amplitude of this force. So the second thing is, so the force is a vector. So knowing, just knowing the amplitude is not enough. So that's why we also need to determine the, uh, the, uh, the direction of the force, okay? So if you want to determine the direction of the Lorentz force, you need to use your right hand and then you're, we're trying to create a right hand called, uh, Cartesian coordinate. So that means your thumb is gonna be the X axis. And then your forefinger is gonna be your Y. And then the, your middle finger is gonna be a Z axis. So what we do is you use your thumb to follow the direction of your current. And then you use your forefinger to follow the direction of your flux. So that means this is your X direction. Let me see if that's clear enough. So that's your X, that is your Y, 
and then your mid finger is going to create the uh, it's going to give you the force direction. So in this case, let me see x y. So it's going downward. It's going into the play. So if you do the same thing for the uh, the wire on the left hand side, so then the force is going out of the plane. So which means in this case, we're getting a rotation in that direction. So the right hand side goes into the plane, left hand side going out goes out of the plane. So that creates a rotation. So that's the uh, working principle for a typical DC motor. So how can we model that? So usually when we, model, when we have a DC motor, what we do is we model our DC motor in a uh, equivalent circuit. So because you have a coil, the coil is made of copper wires. The copper wire itself has some resistance. And then because we have a coil in it, so this coil also have some inductance. And then the, and then the motor itself, you can consider it as a uh, electric generator because as this uh, coil rotates inside of the magnetic field, it also has some like, it also generates some uh, electric, electric uh, potential. So this electric potential is called uh, back EMF or counter EMF. So EMF stands for electromagnetic field. And then because it's a DC motor, so that's why we have a DC voltage source and then it results in a DC current, okay? All right, when it, once you have these uh, equivalent circuit, you don't have, to, uh, perhaps you haven't learned any like circuit uh, in your previous class, but then once you have these equivalent circuit, you can write your voltage as a function of current. Your current equals to I, R, plus L D I D T plus the back EMF we use E B as the back EMF. So this E B is the voltage across this back EMF element. All right, so because it's DC motor, we already so we know that your E B is E times phi times omega. So your Ke is called a back EMF coefficient or electromagnetic field coefficient. So phi, again, that's your flux. Uh, as we mentioned before, this flux is a constant. Once you pick your permanent magnets, it's already given. So your omega is the uh, speed of your motor. Oops. So which means if you have, have higher speed, then you have a higher EMF force or electromagnetic field, okay? So that's your V, that's your electric equation. Because it's a, because it's a motor, we need another equation in the mechanical side. This motor is generating a torque how this torque is related to the electric input. So this equation is called T equals to KT phi times I. So T is the output torque of your system. I is the current in your DC motor. Phi again is the flux. KT is the uh, torque coefficient, is a constant again. To simplify our discussion, we usually assume that kT equals to ke equals to a constant k. All right. So up to this point, we learned two equations, one in, in, uh, for the electric system, the other one for the uh, mechanical system. So most of them are constants. So let me use a different color to circle out all the uh, varying variables. The torque is varying, the current is varying, the voltage is varying, 
and what else? And then your, uh, your speed is varying, so your omega is varying, okay? So there, is a, there are a lot of variables in these two equations. So in order to simplify it, so let's um, replace the i in the first equation by t over k5. So we have v equals to i is t r over k5 plus k5 omega, right? So what we so the um how we get this equation is just by merging one, two, three. So let's merge one plus two plus three. We we replace the E B by K phi omega. We replace all the I by T. So in this equation, we have V as an unknown, T is a variable, omega is a variable. So all the other terms, they are constants once you design, once you select your DC motor. If you have three variables in one equation, then you can easily do uh, control, um, control of, of variables. So the first thing is, if we have a constant, let's name it case A, if you have a constant T, Yeah, maybe what happened to, oh, sorry, I think I forgot one thing. Yep, so there's another term in over there. It's called L D T, let me see, what is I, K over phi. Yeah, we do have a, that's D T, uh, let me write it in a different way. Okay, five dt dt. Okay, we do have a third term. I forgot to mention this one. The reason why we can ignore the last one is because we assume the driving torque is constant by assuming t is constant. Okay. If your t is a constant, then dt 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 can be ignored. Then you only focus on the two terms. If you have a constant torque, that means you need a higher voltage to get the higher speed, right? If t is constant, the first term is uh, is constant. So when you have a higher rotation speed, you need a higher voltage. Make sense? All right, so that's something we need to remember. Uh, the other thing is the, uh, if you look at this relationship between the torque and the uh, omega, so in this case, the second case is we assume your, your V is constant. Or is is actually better to assume your I is constant. If your I is constant, you can also assume the last one is constant, right? Because the last one dt dt is related to di dt. So that means that in this case, your last term is also is also a zero. So you can only focus on the first two terms. So if your I is constant, then if you look at it here, let's assume your V is also constant. That means your T and omega, if you increase your T, then you're reducing your omega, right? So which means, so this, uh, the case B tells us that if you give a, a constant electric power to your system, because here we, fo we fix both the I and V, I plus V equals to the power, the electric power. So if we fix the electric power of your system, that means if we want more torque, we need to reduce the speed. All right, so that's why we get these, uh, these curves. 
this curve is called characteristic curve, characteristic curve of your DC motor. So if your left-hand side is constant, this one is ignored, then your T and omega, they're actually in a linear relationship. If you draw it on a 2D plane, so the x-axis torque is T, the y-axis speed is omega, then it gives you this triangle, all right? So usually your motor is gonna operate at one point inside of this triangle. It's either on the line or inside of the line, okay? So if it works in these points, we call this point operation point. This operation point has a projection on the torque, has a projection on your, uh, on your speed. And then this area enclosed is the power of your motor. Because by definition, torque times speed, that's the power. So that means this rectangular gives you the power of the, of the motor. Okay, so then my question is, how to best choose this operation point? Let's name it as P. What is the best P? So when you choose a DC motor, you want the motor to output as much power as possible, right? So that means you want this shaded area to be maximized. So let's look at two extreme positions. If your P is in these points, so that means you have no load to your motor. So in here, you actually have zero output torque. That means your motor is rotating in, in free space. It's not driving anything. So it's not able to output any torque. So if you operate in this point, that's P2, that's P1. In this point, you basically your motor is locked down. So that means there is like a huge clamp holding the output axis of your motor. And then your motor is trying the best to drive this clamp, but it's not able to move it. So in this case, even though it's able to generate large torque, but it's not able to generate any deformation. So it also generates zero uh, power. So the best operation point is, this point P is in the middle of P1 and P2. So it doesn't have to be square, it can be a rectangular, but then this P is gonna be the middle point of this line. P is in the middle. Oops. Well, usually the rated torque is the maximum torque you can generate. But then you, you actually want to work at around 50% of the maximum torque. Because if you work around the maximum torque, then you're actually not generating any speed. It's still working, but the problem is it's not able to generate output any power. Yes, we're trying to maximize the power. So that's, that's how you want to design your motor, right? You want to select a motor that outputs the maximum power. All right, this, so that's the first thing. That's the first thing we need to remember. So P is the middle of the point. So then we have the maximum power. Or in other words, we have the maximum shaded area. So, 
So the second thing is, uh, let's look at these P point. As I said, the best P point is you want to make sure your P is on this line. So you're not wasting the capability of your motor. If you work, your P point is inside of this line, that means you can actually pick another motor which has a much lower rated torque, much lower rated speed. And then usually that's much cheaper. If you're operating inside of this triangle, the best idea is actually reduce the size or power of your, uh, your motor, okay? But then the, uh, the other question is, if you want a point outside of the tri this triangle, there is no way you can use this motor because follow the, uh, follow this equation, your motor can never reach that point. So that's why you have to choose a much bigger motor for your, uh, for your design. So, okay, so usually when you want to move this further away, then you want a higher torque, higher omega. If you look at the equation number, number one and number three, if you need a higher omega and a higher torque, if you, especially if you need higher torque, then you need a higher current. So in America, I think you use AWG. I think that's called American Wire Gauge. You can actually check the Wikipedia to see how the wire size has to be increased with respect to the maximum uh, current. So usually, the higher current you want to apply to your DC motor, the, the uh, thicker wires you have to use for your coil. So if you use thicker wires, that means you have a much bigger DC motor. So that means if you look at these uh, this speed torque curve as this line moving towards the outside of this plane, you're increasing the size of your motor and you're also increasing the, uh, the cost of your motor. So we want to bring this line as close as possible. At the same time, we want to make sure is your P point is always within the triangle. Make sense? So we can look at we can look at the one example here. So I'm not sure you have if you have a completed do different motors have different slow. Uh yes. So usually when you buy a motor, you should uh, check so they should usually provide the uh, characteristic uh curve for you. And then if they're not providing this curve for you, usually they will provide you this P1 and P2 point as an extreme point. Uh, I think most of the time, if you're operating on the line, it would be fine. So the, um, the true risk for burning, burning it up is actually the P2 point. You don't want to lock your output shot. If you lock it down, then you might have a chance to burn it up. All right, so if you have, if you got a chance to finish your homework number, uh, is that homework five or, or if you get a chance to actually check the previous examples in my uh, force dynamic lectures, if you plot the output torque, T input, actually the input torque, which is the torque at the uh, input link. Let's use this crank slider as an example. So what we do is we plot these inputs torque as a function of these theta two angle. Okay, so this is your theta two angle. This is your input torque. If you got a chance to check my code, you can find it out that this t, t input torque is not a constant, it's actually varying. So at some point, you need a much less torque to drive it. At some point, you need a maximum, you need a large torque to drive it. So let's recall that characteristic curve. You have your omega, in this case, yours, you have your torque, in this case you have your T input, zero. 
and then you have your uh, speed. In this case, is the theta two dot because we're driving the theta two, and then usually you have this line, and then we need to make sure that your p point is inside of this line. Is within uh, so your, we need to make sure your p is inside of this triangle. All right. So in this case, let's assume our theta two dot is constant. That's how we solved our uh, force dynam dynamics previously, right? We always assume the input link is a constant speed to simplify our discussion. So let's let's say our theta two dot is a constant and then this is our theta oh sorry oops so this is our theta two dot so that's the theta two dot we desired that's the theta two dot we want to generate and then you can see that this torque is varying in a very large uh, range. So as I said, your p-point can never go beyond this line. So that means this line should be able to cover the maximum torque there, right? This is your T maximum. So which means you need to design a motor such that these, these points is your T maximum. Make sense? So which means in the, if you want to directly use a DC motor to drive your uh, linkage, your motor should have a characteristic line of this purple color. So that's the farthest your P point can go because that's when your torque has a maximum. But Besides, so except for that point, most of the time your torque is actually smaller than this peak, right? So that means most of the time you're actually operating in here. There's only one time point you're gonna reach that point, this, reach that line, then most of the time is gonna operate in, inside of the triangle. As I mentioned before, if you operate inside of the tri triangle, you're not using the full capability of your motor. That means you're over design your, your driving motor, which usually means you spend much more money than, than it should cost, okay? Is there a way we can bring this down, bring this line closer to the center so we can use a smaller motor? So it's like a, so that's, that's the power of flywheel. So that's why we want to design a flywheel. The function of this flywheel is by using it, we, we are able to bring this purple line close to the center, to the origin O, such that we can reduce the size of the motor. And then, and, and then I think it's really like a bank. So it's like a bank for energy. So, once you have, so like for example, in these regions, so these, let me draw this line first. So that line is called the average torque. The, the way you calculate your T average is you integrate your torque input with respect to theta two from zero all the way to two pi, and then divided by two pi. So that's your average torque. So that means within one rotation, that's the average torque you want your motor to generate. So in the, in the red area, your T input, Put is actually smaller than T average, right? So in this case, that means if you design a motor that generates your T average torque, then in these red areas, you're actually saving energy. So it's like you have the good days. You, you cannot spend all the money you have 
then the best idea is can we save these energy to a bank so that when we operate in the uh, green area, the green area is when your T input is larger than average, that's the bad days. So you want to use the energy you saved in the good days to drive the bad days. Make sense? All right, so how can we design this bank? How can we make sure? So the first thing is we need to make sure the bank is big enough to save all your energy, right? So for example, if your flywheel is only able to store one jewel of energy, but then these red shaded area actually give you a hundred jewel, then the problem is the bank is not large enough to handle that big amount of energy. So we have to, make it make the flywheel much bigger so how big your flywheel should be so that's the next question so uh let me start uh, from the math so when you have an output input shaft that's your input shaft so you're driving uh let's see so use it to drive a a load in this case you can name it as t load or t input so that's what we calculated from force dynamics and then there is another torque tm so that's the motor torque the torque provided by the motor all right so we already know that these two torque together is gonna to rotate your input link. And then your input link is, has this velocity of theta two, acceleration of theta two double dot. According to Euler's equation, these two torque together is gonna to generate a, let me use a different J two, theta two double dot. All right, so that's from Euler's equation. You have a T input minus Tm equals J2 theta two double dot. So this is our motor torque. So as I mentioned before, we hope this motor only needs to generate the average torque, not the peak torque. So that's why we, have, we assume that your Tm is T average, right? So in this case, we can reduce the torque requirement such that we can reduce the size. So eventually we have T input minus T average equals to J2 and theta two double dot. Theta two double dot is D theta two single dot DT, right? Is a velocity, is it one more time derivative for your velocity? So that's from this equation. So you can use, actually use the chain rule. You can have J2 d theta two dot dt, and then you multiply it by d theta two d theta two. So this is just a redundant one, but you're adding d theta two to both denominator and numerator. Okay, by using this chain rule, and then you reorganize everything, you're gonna have J2 d theta two dot d theta two times d theta two dt. So the second term becomes theta two dot d theta two. Make sense? It's just a lot of math going around. Like you start from the uh, Newton's second law or Euler's, Euler's second law, and then you change 
the uh, you, you add one more d theta too, and then trying to make sure there is no dt in your equation. So after doing that, you can move your d theta two to the left hand side. You're going to have d t input minus t average d theta two equals to j two theta two dot d theta two dot, right? So that's actually partial, that's a uh, differential equation. To solve this differential equation, you can use the, um, the basic method here. So you can do integration on both sides. Then you can get rid of this these, uh, D term. So let's focus on the uh, integration on the left hand side. You have, let's assume that you start from the minimum value of your theta two dot all the way to the maximum value of your theta two dot. So that's integration with respect to theta two dot. But then on your left hand side, your integration is, re is, respe is respect to the position, not the velocity. So that's why you have to integrate from theta two prime and theta two double prime. So what, what does that theta two prime mean? So that's the position value when theta two dot is minimum. That's when your theta two dot is maximum. You also, you want to make sure both sides, so you're actually integrating within the same range. So that's why when your left-hand side is from theta two min to theta two max, your left-hand side should also be between these two uh, positions. But then because it's not, with, but then it's because it's with, it's with respect to the position. So that's why your position should correspond to the velocity um, extremes, all right? So left hand side is kind of tricky because you have theta two prime, theta two double prime. We have no idea about what, what that is. So, but then your left hand, your right hand side is straightforward. You can directly integrate it as half J two, theta two maximum dot square minus theta two minimum square. All right, so right hand side, it does, does it make sense? All right, sorry about that. I think my daughter is crying on the background. <laughs> yeah, she's, she has been staying at home for, for two weeks. Sorry about that. Um, okay, so the right hand side, we have half J2 theta two maximum square minus theta two oh, dot minimum square, okay? So do, do you know what's the meaning of that? So that means your theta two, your input link is actually, it's no longer in a constant speed. It actually have a small variation in the speed because of the speed variation you're gonna get an energy variation, right? This is your actual your rotation, your kinetic energy associated with, with the rotation. So that's your data E. So let's, so let's leave it there for, for, uh, for, um, for current moment. Let's focus on the left hand side. So your T input minus T average integrate with respect to, to theta two. So let's go back to these plot again. So again, that's your torque. That's your position theta two. All right. So T input minus T average, and then integrate with respect to theta two, which means we're calculating these areas, right? This area enclosed by that function, which is a red line, 
and and these axes because we minus it by t average so we have to move these average move these axes above by t average we need to calculate these uh, shaded area so let's look at what what is the physical meaning for these curve so because we already assume that the first assumption we assume your motor is generating t average only so we assume that your motor is only generating the average torque so that means your motor is always generating these line okay but then the red line indicates how much torque is is uh, it, uh, is being asked by your me mechanism so let's look at these region let's name these as let's name these as point a this is point b so that means from point a to point b so your t requested is actually greater than t average right so that means your mechanism is asking for more torque but then your motor is only providing an average torque so if you go back to these characteristic curve that's your t that's your torque that's your omega we're operating on these line because that's the maximum capability of your motor so it's only is able to moving up and down along this line so if you want more torque what this motor do your motor can only reduce the speed make sense So which means from A to B, because you, it requires more torque than, than the average torque, let's say this is your T average. But then in here, you actually use T more. So the only way you can get this higher torque is to reduce the speed from your, your omega to omega mean, right? All right, so that means your omega, in this case, let me use the same thing because our omega is, is theta two dot. So that means your theta two is reducing from point A to point B. And then the same thing, if you look at B to C, your input torque, your input torque is actually higher than the torque required. And then if you follow these uh, characteristic line, it's actually moving up. So you're actually getting higher velocity. So that means in this range, you have theta two decreasing, theta two dot. And then in this range, you have your theta two dot increasing. The same thing, this here, theta two dot is decreasing. Theta two dot is increasing, right? So if you look at the uh, integration on the left hand side, it's a little bit busy here. So we need to first find the theta two prime when your theta two dot is minimized. So where are the potential minimal theta two dot position? So a, let's name it A, B, C, D, and E. So the potential position is point B and point D, right? Yeah, because between A and B, your theta two is decreasing, but then after that, your theta two is starts to increase again. So that means your B point should have the lowest theta two, at least in this range, right? The same thing applies to D. So that's your where your theta two prime is. Your theta two double prime is then the same thing, A or C. A is equivalent to E because A and E, just from A to E, we completed a full rotation. So A is actually the same as E. So it's either A or C. 
So that means we have four different combinations. So your integration on the left-hand side is either from B to A, or from B to C, or from D to A, or D to C. So there are four different combinations for, for your left-hand side. We need to find the maximum value. So let's, let's look it up. So here is an example. As I said, the integration of the torque minus T average with respect to uh, position theta two is the area of the uh, is an area of this shaded uh, area. So which means from let's write it down from A to B. Uh, let's name it as left hand side. which is the left-hand side of this equation, assume it as equation one. Or I think that's not the best way to, to write it. Let's say uh, this is the integration from, from the starting point to the end point, that's T input minus T average D theta two. The starting point is the first letter. The end point is the second letter. So this average gives you the shaded area. So that's positive 200.73. And then from B to C, we have minus 261.05. And then from C to D, you have positive 153.88. You have D to, let's go back to E, or we can go back to A. So that's minus 92.0. All right. So let's recall that your, your theta 2 prime is B or D. So that means here you have your theta 2 prime. And then here we have your theta two double prime. So we need to integrate. So what we do is we sum, we use, um, what's the best term? What's the best term for that? We, uh, we call Called it accumula accumulated summation. What, I, what does it do is we first sum, sum these two terms. I think that gives you minus 60. And then we sum these two, positive 93.56. And then we sum these two. And then the first one, you just move it directly to the left, positive 200.37. All right, so up to this point, we we're, we're going to know that. So when you have a positive turn here, we are, we are saying that your, your, your motor is not generating enough energy. So when you have a positive sign, that means, okay, your system is lo losing this amount of energy. So positive means system is losing energy. or which you say is, is lack of energy from, from motor. Your system is lack, is lack of this amount of energy from the motor. So that means at from A to B after this point, you're miss, so let's find out here, here, and here. So that means 
your B point, D point, and A point. So at these, all these blue points, you have these positive energies. So that means at all these points, you're actually, you are lack of energy from the motor. So that means at these blue points, your theta two dot should be smaller than the theta two required. That's the actual theta two dot, right? Because we're lacking of we're we're lack of energy. So because we're not we don't have enough energy. So the only thing we can do is just drive the system in a lower speed because that's the amount of energy we have. So at the, all these points, you actually have a lower actual um, uh, rotation speed of rotation. And then which one gives you the minimum theta two dot? So actually, if you look at here, the B point that's your theta two dot minimum, right? Because here we are, we need the most energy at that time point. So that's why the speed is the lowest. So that's why we have theta two dot minimum at point B. So in this case, we only have one negative region, which is from B to C. So that means the only point where when your theta two dot is above the average, the desired speed is here. That's when your theta two dot actual is greater than theta two dot required. In other words, this point is going to be your theta two dot maximum. Uh, what do you mean by move over from A? Mm, let me see. So, how to choose these a starting point is actually arbitrary. If you want, you can make the first line is B to C, C to D, and then D to A and A to B. In this case, you can move the point from B directly to the right. So I think the reason why we directly move it to the right is it all depends on how you choose the starting point. Okay. I think the best way to say it is, it's not the difference between, uh, it's not the difference between these two. It's actually, I should put it in a different way. So to get these value, you sum one to two, that's one plus two. And then these value, I believe is one plus two plus three, that's one plus two plus three plus four. So this one is number one. I think I made, I might made a wrong statement. So that's why it's called accumulated sum. You accumulate these summations like step by step. And then that, I think that also explains why it's just a matter of change, choosing a starting point. Okay. So after doing this accumulated summation, 
you, you find a minimum point and find the theta two maximum, right? Then you just pick these two values. You find the maximum there. You find the minimum there. Okay. You find the maximum and minimum in the accumulated sum, and then your E maximum, we call these energy maximum, minus E minimum. So that is your data E. So this data E gives you an idea about how much energy your flywheel should store. So that determines the maximum size of your uh, flywheel. So that gives you the left-hand side of the equation. Previous equation. All right, so you have data E equals to half J2 theta 2 maximum minus theta 2 minimum square. So if that's where we go back to this, okay? That's the maximum size we, uh, oh, that's the minimum size we needed. Sorry, that's the minimum size because that's the minimum um, amount of energy we need to store. Yes, that's the minimum size of the flywheel. Okay, so let's say the data E is already given, right? We already know that from the accumulated summation. And then on the right-hand side, you have half J2. So this J2 is not the, um, it's not the input link moment of inertia. It's actually the moment of inertia, oops. For the flywheel. So that's J2 is something we want to design. And then your theta two, we can use the, uh, the relationship, theta two maximum dot plus theta two minimum dot theta two maximum dot minus theta two minimum dot. Make sense? You can expand these, the, the difference of two square using this. And then you can see that, let me use a different color. The underlying part becomes the average theta two, right? times J2, that's something we need to find out. And then the last one is theta two maximum, theta two dot minimum. So for convenience, we define another K value. We call this K as fluctuation coefficient. So this K is theta two dot average, theta two dot maximum minus theta two dot minimum. So basically the unit list number, it describes how much percentage, how many percentage does your input velocity is bearing. Okay, so that's why we can replace these by KJ2. Let's see. KJ2, yeah, theta two dot average square. So that means the flywheel moment of inertia J2 should equal to data E over K over theta two square average. So that's how you design your flywheel, flywheel. 
You first using the, uh, use the accumulated summation to find your data E. And then you define how much variation you allowed in your input link. And then you define the uh, average speed in your input link. So here we have three variables on the right hand side. You can actually get some conclusions. The first one is data, when you have a large variation of data E, then your flywheel should, should be bigger. So usually your J2, if you assume is a disk, then is M R square, right? That's a mass of your uh, flywheel. R is the radius of your flywheel. I think it's divided by half. If we assume is a disk, if we assume the flywheel is a disk rotating around the shaft. So that means the higher the J2, the larger the size you need. And then if you have a large torque variation in your, in your mechanism, then you need a larger flywheel. And then the same thing, the, the other thing is if you want less variation in your speed, you actually want a much larger, you want, also want a large flywheel. That also tells us that if you want to use a flywheel in your mechanism, we're actually sacrificing the speed control. So you can no longer maintain a constant input speed. So you're always having some small, a very small K number. So that means you're gonna have fluctuation in your input speed. So that's the uh, drawback for, your, for the flywheel design. So if, if you do want perfect constant speed control, the, you can only increase the size of your motor to make sure your characteristic line covering all the torque values. Then you can do active uh, speed control. But then here, you have to sacrifice that um, a little bit. All right, so that's it for the, uh, that's it for the, uh, for the flywheel control, so for the flywheel design. So in the exam, you need to make sure you understand how to use this equation. You need to make sure you know the uh, meaning of each equation, uh, each variables. Okay. Oh, one more thing. Here, uh, all the unit is in meter per uh, radia. No, sorry. Newton meter radia. That's the torque. That's the area value. And then, if that's the case, then your J is going to be in meter square times kilogram. And then your theta two, your theta two average is in radius per second, radian per second. That's your J, that's your theta two. And K is unitless. And data E is Newton meter radian. You have to keep your uh, unit consistent. Otherwise you might end up in wrong um, values. Okay, so any questions? All right, so let me see. I'm gonna briefly go over project number two. Since it's gonna do in two days. It might be too late to, to uh, explain that. Actually, I saw a lot of interesting solutions in your project number one. I really, so actually more than I expected. So here I said, in my own solution, I said we have 12 links in the system. So I have one, one two, three, four, five, all the way to 12. So that's why I have 10 equations, right? 
So a lot of you actually saw some triangles in the system. So here you have one triangle. Here you have another triangle. So if you, so that means this is a triangular link, right? So that means when you count the link, you have ground link, number two, number three, and then you actually count four, five, six as a single link. And then you have seven, eight, nine, and then your 10, 11, 12. That's another triangular link. You have, that's why you have eight links in total. So that's, then you only need six equations. So in project number one, I saw you have either have 12 links, 10 equations, or eight links, six equations. But then if you have eight links, six equations, you actually need two more equations for the triangles. You need to use either the sine theorem or the cosine theorem to describe these, um, the relationship of these four, four links, okay? So that's why even you have eight links, you still need perhaps eight equations. So that's for project number one. So, and then I think a lot of you actually divide these 12 links into three, uh, actually into, I believe, into five different four bar links. You first solve the one, two, three, four, and then solve the other, and then you actually, you didn't solve them in one shot. You solve them um, step by step. But then if you want to calculate the velocity, it's actually better to solve all of these equations in one batch. So let's use these, for example, if you have 12 links, 10 equations. You don't care about what these, how many equations you have. You just orient everything into F equals to F1. Da, 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 F2 and also all the way to F10. And then that equals to some constant, right? And then that's, your, that's all the nonlinear equations. And then when you calculate velocity, it's just Jx dot equal to C dot, right? Where is your J? Your J is partial F, partial X. What is your x? Your x is just column vector of the very first unknown to the tenth unknown. You can actually use my, my, my code posted on Blackboard. That's gonna work. Um, that's still gonna work. The only thing you need to change is the number of equations. You just add more equations to the code. And then you can do the same thing for the acceleration, right? You just do j dot x dot plus j x double dot equals to c double dot. All right, so that's for project number two. If, you're, if you still solve the velocity step by step, I think it's fine. It's just gonna take me a longer time to grade it, but yeah, you can still do that, but then the best idea is just organize all these equations in one group and then use the uh, Jacobian method to solve them in one shot. So that's for project number two. And then I think homework number five, I already posted the announcement online. I forgot to give you all the, the length of all the links. You just use the length from, the, uh, from lecture 16 or 17. All right. So that's it for today. Great. Nice to nice to nice to uh, talk to you all. See you on Thursday. Bye.